Can't you just feel it? The conflict is becoming apparent in our culture. It reminds me of those words of John Paul II. We're now living in the final confrontation between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between the church and the anti-church, between Christ and the antichrist. And if we don't choose to know God's word, to believe God's word, and follow God's word, we're going to be a sitting duck for all kinds of confusion, all kinds of disorder. Those are really important choices that people have to make. And these choices are difficult. Who am I going to marry? What kind of life am I going to live? How am I going to raise my kids? What am I going to do with my time, my talent, and my treasure? And I have to make a choice today. Jesus says to each one of us, I came that you might have life and have it to the full. The question is, do we want it? Hey, welcome to another week of The Choices We Face. Uh, we have a very special guest today, John Birch, and he's a lawyer. He's from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, my brother-in-law, who lives in Grand Rapids, and they're both members of Legatus, this organization of Catholic chief executives, said, you got to have John Birch on the show. And so, hey, we have John Birch on the show, and thank you so much for agreeing. My pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Tell, tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey and how you got to be part of a Catholic organization like Legatus, you know, founded here in Ann Arbor by Tom Monahan, founder of Domino's Pizza, and then also how you got to be arguing some really significant cases before the Supreme Court. Well, it started very simply. I grew up uh, in Grand Ledge, Michigan, after being born in Minnesota, which is where my parents are from. Uh, one brother, one sister. We made sure that we never missed Mass and, unless someone was ill every week. Uh, you know, so a, a firm foundation. But my dad was insurance. My mom stayed at home. Um, I went to Western Michigan University for college and started as an engineering major. I uh, certainly had no visions of the U.S. Supreme Court dancing in my head at that point. Um, but, but God did a lot of things along the way to put me on this path. Uh, the first thing is he put a book in front of me as a freshman there at Western. It was called One L by Scott Tarot, and it was about his experience as a first-year law student at Harvard. And I read that, and I didn't know any lawyers. I didn't really know what lawyers did other than watching them on TV. But I saw that Socratic way of teaching and the logic that was inherent in, in that and thought, that's what I would like to do. I want to go to law school. And so I switched, I became a double music and math major because those were two things I loved and you could major in anything to go to law school. Did you play an instrument or? I did, I was clarinet performance, but also played a lot of piano okay. um, for weddings, receptions, other music majors, things like that. Yeah. And then ended up at the University of Minnesota Law School. Mm -hmm. My wife and I met at Western, got married, and she came out with me and, and got her master's degree in social work at Minnesota. Mm -hmm. um, so from Minnesota, I went to a federal judicial clerkship and then went into a large Michigan law firm uh, where I practiced commercial litigation. Um, but I had this passion for appeals, the things that happen to cases after they're done in the trial court and the judge or the jury have made their decision. Um, and so I started an appellate practice group and uh, over time started to grow that. Art, started you started your own? Um, well, at the big law firm. Um, oh, yeah. We, we had a subgroup that focused on appeals. I started to argue in the Michigan Supreme Court. And, and then God stepped in again. Um, Bill Schuette uh, was a Michigan Court of Appeals judge. And he stepped down from the bench and joined the firm so he could run for attorney general. Uh, you know, and so head of the appeals practice, former Court of Appeals judge, that was someone I wanted to get to know. And so uh, we became fast friends. And uh, when he was elected two years later, he asked me to become the Michigan Solicitor General. Wow. And, and that's the person in state government who represents the state in the state court and the, the state Supreme Court and the U.S. Supreme Court. Wow. You must have been a pretty young Solicitor General. I was. Yeah. I was only in my mid-30s at that point. <laughs> yeah. And uh, over the next three years, God blessed me with eight U.S. Supreme Court arguments, which was more than any non-U.S. government lawyer in the country. So, uh, so cases that came through Michigan that you were defending, you defended before the Supreme Court? Correct, exactly. What you kind know, of cases would those be? Um, some of them were criminal, um, you know, murderers and things like yeah. that who had been let out of jail by federal appellate courts and we needed to put them back in. Um, but also there was a, a communications case that uh, kept everybody's phone bills a little bit lower. Um, and importantly, a Michigan constitutional amendment that prohibited discrimination in public university admissions. You could not use race or sex oh, as yes, admissions that criteria. A, that's a famous that's a famous uh, thing. Yes. So I, I defended that one in front of the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, won that one 7-2. We were pretty excited about that. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, and so then I was going back to, to private practice at the end of my three-year stint and just assumed that I would go back to representing Fortune 500 companies. Mm. Um, and then God intervened again uh, because I had worked on a lot of high-profile cases, some that involved very important social issues. Uh, I started to get more phone calls to do similar types of work. And uh, one of those cases was to argue for Michigan, the same-sex marriage case in the U.S. Supreme Court, Obergefell. Um, but it also included offers to do other things that, that attorney generals and uh, governors were asking me to take on. And it got too politically hot for the big law firm. Um, they passed what uh, they called a controversial matter policy. And so you could represent a corporate polluter. You could even represent a murderer. But if you wanted to do pro-life litigation or religious liberty work, yeah, that was too controversial. Isn't it, isn't it something how how that's become like the dominating spirit in our culture these days. So you could do almost anything except that. Yes. Yeah. It's this Marxist wokeism that pervades almost all of our large companies and particularly our nation's large law firms. And, and you could see that all the way back in 2015 in the same sex marriage case of Bergefell. Among the, the nation's 250 largest law firms, something like 60 or 70 of them filed briefs in support of same-sex marriage. Guess how many filed on our side defending the Catholic Church's view of marriage? Zero. Not a single one. Wow. Um, so a after... How, how, did, how did it get so dominant? How did it... Because a lot of these law firms, you know, have been traditional, have traditional practices, have Catholic partners, have, you know, religious people in the law firms, how did it, how did it get to be so intimidated and so in, in service of this agenda? Well, I, I think it happened in the law firms the same way as it did in the rest of corporate America. And there, there were two driving forces. Um, one, there were people who wanted to push a certain agenda um, that rejected the church's teachings on marriage and human sexuality. And, and they rose to become the heads of HR departments became diversity and inclusion vice presidents and, and things like that. And so within the corporations, within the law firms, they were starting to, to spread the message that that was what the company or the law firm was all about. Um, the other thing is that those who push that type of um, modern sexuality agenda are really loud. <laughs> and, and so when the, the corporations did something that supported um, you know, the church's values on human sexuality, then a couple of people who dissented on the other side would protest and talk to the media and things like that. But when corporations and law firms pushed those agendas, the, the sexuality agendas, conservatives didn't tend to speak up, or if they did, they didn't do it very loudly in the press. That's really interesting. Do you think some of these people purposely went for those positions and it was like it was a purposeful strategy to kind of gain certain positions and then be really loud about things? No question that that happened in the same way that people with certain progressive viewpoints have taken over the media. You know, the, the surveys all show now that 90 percent of the political contributions from those who are in the media, not just the corporations, but the reporters and the producers and everybody else are all on the side of this Marxist woke capitalism. So the this is almost like, like a Marxist strategy for taking over a country. It, it is, you know, and so all of a sudden the, the media and the large corporations, the universities, we see it there too. Yeah. And so it, it becomes um, not only difficult, but dangerous to be a Catholic conservative in the modern culture, because if you want to keep your job, you have to wear the ally pin. Or if you want to be able to have your business open, you need to express messages as a creative professional that violate your religious beliefs. Yeah. Um, so it's very difficult. Wow. It's, it's, it's almost hard to explain without supernatural power at work, you know, demonic power. I mean, it's, it's almost hard to believe that so quickly so many people who really aren't there in their heart have become intimidated and, and enlisted in a cause that they really don't believe in. Mm -hmm. but, but if you look throughout the history of the Bible and the history of Christianity, um, going all the way back into the, the nation of Israel and Judaism, um, that we're always doing that. Society is you know, always having moments where we're, we're very close with God and then we forget his promises, we forget our promises, we walk away. And, and even the, the well-meaning people in the middle just kind of go with the flow. And all of a sudden you're worshiping the golden calf or Baal or, you know, child sacrifice, all these things. Um, so it, it's just a, a, a function of the human condition that we repeat that mistake over and over again. That's, that's really a great comparison because that's exactly what's happening. The Lord kept saying, 
Don't take on the customs of the nations around you. Don't worship their gods. But here we go again. Yes. <laughs> here we go again, you know, taking on the the customs of the nations around us and worshiping their gods. You know, it's somebody just sent me a video of the opening ceremony for the Commonwealth Games, you know, all the, the former British Commonwealth. And it's quite shocking. There's this humongous calf or bull and, and people are bowing down before it and worshiping it. It looks like, like a symbol of life, of strength, of energy, of the earth, you know, type of thing. And you say like, do they, do they realize what they're doing? Do they know this story? Do you, do you know what this symbolizes? You know, maybe they do. Right. Well, they're, they're obviously not students of history, number one. Uh, but, but number two, all you have to do is look at the Pew Research polls to see that you know, vast numbers of people are, are walking away from religion and professing a belief in no higher power. And yet written on all of our hearts is that desire to know and be loved by God. Yeah. And so when you reject God, then you look for golden calves in other places. And, and sometimes it's actual statues. Other times it's entertainment stars. Other times it's athletics. Other times it's power, prestige, yeah. money, all those things. Yeah. They, they become our false gods, yeah. just like all those years ago in the desert. Okay, well, it sounds like you've decided to embrace a call to fight a battle against this and to try to hold back the tide of evil that's sweeping over the world? Yes, well, I'll, I'll, I'll pick up my story then. So the, the, the firm enacts this controversial matter policy that basically only applies to me and to my cases. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and so in a, a one week period, they turned down two of my requests. Um, one from the North Carolina governor who wanted me to assist them in defending the so-called um, bathroom bill that they had passed a few years ago. Oh, yeah. And the other by the Nebraska attorney general who wanted me to lead a 10 state lawsuit against the Obama administration, which was rewriting Title IX to require that boys who identify as girls be allowed in the showers and the locker rooms and the sports teams. So um, they, they said no to those cases and I immediately resigned. I gave them my two weeks notice, not knowing what was gonna come next. Um, so I, I founded my own solo practice yeah. and uh, opened the door on Monday, hadn't put up a website or done any advertising, but I'd sent out emails to people. Mm -hmm. And on Tuesday, I got a call from the Indiana Attorney General's office. They had a new law that prohibited the sale or transfer of aborted fetal body parts and tissue. It had been challenged by the University of Indiana. And because a number of their attorneys were law professors adjunct at the University of Indiana, they were conflicted out and they needed someone outside the Attorney General's office to defend the pro-life view in this issue. And, and so that was the first case at Birch Law. Didn't take long, did it? did it? not take long. You know, God confirmed that, that yeah. as a family, we had made the right choice. And yeah. I, I want to emphasize that every one of these career choices to go do the solicitor general position, to leave the big law firm for a solo practice, did it with my wife and the kids all talking tell me, and praying tell me, around the table. Tell me table. briefly about, you're, you're married. So tell me a little bit about- Yes. Um, we've been married for 28 years now. My wife and I met in college and we've got five kids ages 25 to 15. Uh, every one of them looking to take their Catholic faith out into the world in beautiful ways. Uh, the oldest in medical school, she'll be a, a pediatric oncologist. The second, a sacred architect. He just got his first job. He's designing Catholic churches and chapels in the Catholic wow. or traditional style, classical style. Wow. Yeah. Um, and then we've got a, a music therapist and a uh, future physicist uh, coming up at Catholic colleges and then our youngest in high school. Well, you know, I think the Lord has given you special grace for your family because of the commitment you've made and the sacrifice you've made and the steps in faith that you've taken to, to uphold human life and his law. Well, one thing I'd like to emphasize for any family who's watching this, whether your parents, grandparents, um, Father Dave Pavanka talks about how do you keep your kids Catholic? And even families that take their kids to, to mass every week, put them through Catholic schools, they see them lose their faith in, in college. And, and there's never a guarantee that you're going to be able to help them do that. They're independent adults. They can make their own decisions. But one of the things he mentions is that they need to have parents and family friends where they can see that their Catholic faith made a difference in how they lived their life. And I think it was our decision to walk away from you know, the big money and the prestige of the big law firm to follow what God's will was for our, our family. 
that our, our kids seeing that in action, it made a difference in the choices that they've made about the careers they want to pursue, where they went to college, the friends that they've made. Um, so that's just hugely important that we show them that it's more than just mass on Sunday, that we live our lives in a different way because of our faith. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks be to God. Yeah. Thank you, thank you Lord. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's get back to uh, your battle. Yeah. So I, I, I moved to this new Would law firm. Would you believe we only have 12 minutes left? I know. It's going to go way too fast. <laughs> yeah. Um, so so I, I did that for a couple of years and started to work with Alliance Defending Freedom. And Alliance Defending Freedom is the largest organization in the world defending religious liberty, free speech, the right to life, families, parental rights, and um, uh, I'm missing one. Other good things. Other good things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, and so I was helping them with their U.S. Supreme Court cases. And I was involved in um, getting their attorneys re ready to argue the case involving Jack Phillips, the baker in Masterpiece oh, yeah, Cake Shop. Yeah. I feel so bad for those guys. I know. He, yeah. he, he's still in they, court. I know, we, they, we can talk about him. They keep going after him. I know. They keep going after him. It's been almost a decade that he's in, been in court. Um, so, so anyway, I, I started helping them pro bono. And then they asked me to come aboard full time as the head of their Supreme Court and appellate practice. And so that's what I do now. My, my full-time job is litigating God's docket. And it's everything from the Dobbs case, uh, where we were intimately involved as co-counsel with the state of Mississippi in finally overturning Roe versus Wade, um, to religious liberty cases, um, everything from the baker to now a website designer. We've got a case up there this fall. Um, to the athletics issues that we're dealing now under Title IX, the, the women's sports, uh, you, you name it, we have a role in every single one of these cultural issues trying to keep the door open for the spread of the gospel. That, that's our mission. Yeah, well, that's, that's really great. And, and there's such hatred being heaped upon people like you, such hatred being heaped upon the Supreme Court who would dare say, no, this is not in the Constitution. Yes, this is a violation of the First Amendment. You know, this is a violation of religious freedom. Like, like the almost irrational, infernal hatred that's being poured out on people like you and people who are trying to hold the door open for traditional values. Yes. Well, the, the Southern Poverty Law Center, um, which in its heyday what was a good organization, but has fallen far from that, that pedestal, um, calls Alliance Defending Freedom a hate group because we defend God's design for marriage and the protection of human life. Um, and I, I can't tell you how many terrible things have been said about me in social media. Um, my, my boss, Kristen Wagner, she's the incoming CEO. Uh, you know, she was protested at Yale Law School. You may have seen that a few months ago. Um, and, and I think it's, it's, it's two things. You know, one, it's the devil working in the world and anything that's good and holy, he wants to shut down and silence. And yeah. so you know, part of it is that. Uh, but I, I think the other part is just people um, you know, being on this radical agenda and, and not being willing to listen to the truth, even an iota, because if they crack the door, it's going to be too painful. You know, and, and just think about it with abortion. You know, so many of the abortion advocates are women who unfortunately chose abortion at one point. And, and imagine the, the pain and suffering if they would admit for an iota um, that they had taken the life of their own baby. Um, and, and so it's much easier to just yell and protest. Yeah, yeah. And, and even stifle your own conscience under the noise, try to reassure yourself that you're in the majority, that, you know, that th your views are absolutely right and you don't need to listen to anything else. And even kind of try to seal yourself off from hearing anything by labeling it hate speech before you even listen, you know? Yes, exactly. It, it's, it's sort of like a, a guilty conscience trying to protect itself against the painful process of repentance. Exactly. Yeah. And, and so when we're on the receiving end of the, the terrible name calling and yeah. retribution, you know, sometimes people losing their jobs over their faith and things like that. Yeah. We need to always remember that there are deep wounds behind those strident arguments on the other side and that we need to pray for them yeah. and, and that we don't know in God's great judgment what's going to change their life. Right. But certainly being angry and upset with them is not going to help solve the problem. We, yeah. we need to pray for them yeah. constantly. And, Je and Jesus did warn us that if they did it to him, they're going to do it to us. Yes. It was almost the promise, wasn't it? Yeah, he, <laughs> he, he promised happen. it. Yeah, he said, in the world, you will have trouble. If they did it to me, they're going to do it to you. Some will accept, some will not accept. And ultimately, they, they cried out, crucify him, you know, and people are in their hearts wishing that right now, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, so it, it's never been easy to be a Catholic. 
Uh, I don't think that today is special. I, I think it's just the same way that it's been throughout our entire 2000 year history. Um, but you know, my, my encouragement to people is that there are lawyers and yes. others who are out there fighting to keep yes. the doors open for the spread of the gospel. Yeah. And so we need to be brave and courageous and exercise the rights that we have to not only worship in mass, to not only pray with our kids, uh, but to live our Catholic beliefs in the public square. We yeah. have to do that. Yeah. Well, you know, Ann Arbor has been a, a seat of legal resistance to a lot of the stuff. The Thomas More Law Center, the American Center for Justice, you know, and you know, and so there's a lot of people here who are, are very concerned about this. You know, there's a Thomas More Law Center in Chicago. So I've been donating to a number of them. I better I better start donating to you guys. Really, Alliance defending freedom. Yeah, <laughs> we, we we need it. <laughs> so why don't you tell people about how to how to support? Yeah, well, first, anybody who's interested in the work that we do can go to adflegal.org. That's our website. You can get updates on all of our cases. So that includes Lori Smith, the graphic artist and website designer whose case will be in front of the U.S. Supreme Court this fall. Uh, like I mentioned, it's kind of a sequel to The Cake Maker. Um, but whereas the holding in that case was a, a good one for Jack, it was very narrow. And in this case, we hope and pray that we'll get a very broad free speech ruling that protects all creative professionals yeah, going forward. Yeah, into this. Yeah. Yes. Um, and, and then you know they, they can learn about all these other cases that I, I've kind of alluded to, and then there's opportunities for support as well. And, and for some people, that's monetary support. We provide all of our legal assistance pro bono without any cost to the clients. We do it entirely with donations, um, but also prayer support as yeah. well. Um, we've, we've got a whole prayer network yeah. for people, and they'll be alerted when an attorney is going to be going before a court and making an argument so that they can pray specifically for the lawyer and the judge during that time. And, and the U.S. Supreme Court cases are, are really fun um, because all of our offices in the United States and around the world, because we've got an international presence in Europe and India, other places, um, they all shut down for that time when the argument is taking place before the Supreme Court justices and all the staff pray. Wow. Well, that's amazing. So you have offices around the world. So you're like, you're a much bigger organization than I realized. It, it, it's huge. Like I said, the largest organization in the world that does this, we have um, 40 attorneys just in India um, working on religious liberty. And we have lawyers at the European Court of Human Rights, the United Nations, the European Union, um, you name it. And, and if you think that religious liberty is bad in the United States, try living in India for, yeah, well, for a year. I mean, there, just to announce that you're converting to Christianity can be a death sentence, um, certainly loss of your career, your house, you know, things like that. Um, so, so we have very little to complain about relative to our Catholic brothers and sisters around the world. Yet. Yet. <laughs> yeah. Keep yes. fighting the good fight. Yeah. Well, maybe tell us about a case or two or whatever we have time for, maybe just one case and, and how you approached it and what happened at the Supreme Court. Well, let, let's talk about the same-sex marriage case yeah. because yeah. I, I've won the vast majority of the cases that I've argued in the U.S. Supreme Court, but that's one that I, I did not. And we pretty much knew going in that that was going to happen. Just reading the tea leaves, we knew that Justice Kennedy, who had already authored two opinions that were strongly in favor of same-sex rights, uh, you know, was going to join the left wing of the court yeah. to, to do this. Um, but nonetheless, it was important to go and to speak the truth and make a historical record. Yeah. And, and right from the very beginning, you, you could almost see how farcical the Supreme Court argument was. Um, I began by saying that the case was not about the, the best way to define marriage. It was who had the right to decide how to define marriage. Was it the U.S. Supreme Court where the Constitution was silent on that issue? Or was it the states acting through the democratic process, legislatures, ballot initiatives, and things like that? And, and the answer to that is, is pretty obvious. It, Constitution is silent. It goes back to the states. Um, so that was the opening. And Justice Sotomayor interrupted me after 12 seconds and said, well, counsel, no one's telling anyone who they have to marry. It was a total non sequitur. It had nothing to do yeah. with the issue. And then later, Justice Alito asked the, the lawyer representing the same-sex couples uh, and a question. Imagine you had four people, two men, two women. Um, they're all lawyers, so they can voluntarily consent and they want to get married. Now, under your theory, what, who's to say they can't get married? And the lawyer said, well, because historically, only two people have always been allowed to get married. And, and so, you know, yeah, exactly. That's the reaction. You laugh and think, oh, okay, so now we're, we're going to win this 9-0. Except no one in the courtroom, even the justices on the bench, laughed at that remark. Oh, they yeah. just nodded their heads. Oh, yeah, marriage has always been between two people and, and didn't distinguish the difference 
or the, the, the sameness of that argument and the argument they were making with respect to same-sex yeah. marriage. It's amazing how people are losing the capacity sometimes for reason, for logic. And yes. Who would have ever thought that the Catholic Church would emerge as one of the biggest defenders of reason, logic, and evidence? Yes. Well, that's the problem with our public universities. Yeah. So, so walking out of that courtroom today, that's when it crystallized for me. Out on the steps, there were thousands of people saying love is love and you know all that, that kind of stuff. And the only group that was representing our understanding of marriage were those individuals who had the signs that said gay people will go to hell and, and, and things like that. Um, we, we had completely lost the public narrative on why God's plan for marriage was not hateful, but loving, and that it is a source of human flourishing over millennia. Um, and, and so it just reiterated to me how important it is that as, as much importance of the, the legal cases are and the arguments, it's the culture that we have to fix. Yeah. And if we don't fix the culture, the courts are going to continue to follow it. Uh, yeah. So, you know, any short-term gains that we, we win yeah. will eventually be lost unless we can evangelize. And this is where Catholics, the churches have to step forward and start speaking the truth in love and start educating their own people to begin with and then be going wider in the culture. Exactly. You know, as Catholics, far too rare or uh, infrequently do we hear homilies about marriage, about the meaning of human sexuality, about the importance of protecting life from conception. We need a heck of a lot more of that. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of fearing people's opinion rather than proper fear of God, you know, yeah. Hey, John, thank you so much, not only for being on the program, but for what you're doing. Uh, thank God for your family. Thank God for the Alliance Defending Freedom. And hey, let, let's all pray for John. Let's all pray for the Alliance Defending Freedom. And let's contribute as we're able. And we'll put the website information on, on the screen so you can access it. Uh, my friend Peter Herbeck, uh, who John knows, and Peter knows John, and uh, through Legatus, uh, has written a booklet called Receiving Fire. Uh, we got to have a little fire for God's word. We got to have a little fire for the truth, a little fire for, for human beings and, and, and the good that comes from following God. And so we'd like to make this booklet available to you at no cost just for the asking because of the generosity of our donors. And if you just call the 800 number on the screen or go to our website, renewalministries.net, and click send me the free booklet, we'll send it right out to you. Jesus said, I've come to cast fire on the earth, would that it were already ablaze. The Bible gives us a striking image of Jesus Christ in glory with eyes flaming fire, revealing a heart of burning love between God the Father and God the Son. It's that fire that Jesus wants to give to each and every one of us, a living flame of love and grace for those who receive it, but it's also a fire of judgment for those who refuse it. In this short booklet, I want to help you understand and to receive the fire Jesus desires to ignite in your heart. To receive a free copy, visit our website or call the number on the screen.